At the end of the last word, I fell forward. Together, my parents sang what they had written, then let me rest. My mother fanned my back. We'll have you with us until your back heals, she said. When I could sit up again, my mother brought two mirrors, and I saw my back covered entirely with words in red and black files, like an army, like my army. My parents nursed me just as if I had fallen in battle after many victories. Soon I was strong again. A white horse stepped into the courtyard where I was polishing my armor. Though the gates were locked tight, through the moon door it came, a kingly white horse. It wore a saddle and bridle with red, gold, and black tassels dancing. The saddle was just my size with tigers and dragons tooled and swirls. The white horse pawed the ground for me to go. On the hooves of its near forefoot and hind foot was the ideograph to fly. My parents and I had waited for such a sign. We took the fine saddlebags off the horse and filled them with salves and herbs, bluegrass for washing my hair, extra sweaters, dried peaches. They gave me a choice of ivory or silver chopsticks. I took the silver ones because they were lighter. It was like getting wedding presents. The cousins and the villagers came bearing bright orange jams, silk dresses, silver embroidery scissors. They brought blue and white porcelain bowls filled with water and carp, the bowls painted with carp, fins like orange fire. I accepted all the gifts, the tables, the earthenware jugs, though I could not possibly carry them with me, and culled for travel only a small copper cooking bowl. I could cook in it and eat out of it and would not have to search for bowl-shaped rocks or turtle shells. I put on my men's clothes and armor and tied my hair in a man's fashion. How beautiful you look, the people said. How beautiful she looks. A young man stepped out of the crowd. He looked familiar to me as if he were the old man's son or the old man himself when you looked at him from the corners of your eyes. I want to go with you, he said. You will be the first soldier in my army, I told him. I leaped onto my horse's back and marveled at the power and height it gave me. Just then, galloping out of nowhere, straight at me, came a rider on a black horse. The villagers scattered except for my one soldier, who stood calmly in the road. I drew my sword. Wait! shouted the rider, raising weaponless hands. Wait! I have traveled here to join you. Then the villagers relinquished their real gifts to me, their sons. Families who had hidden their boys during the last conscription volunteered them now. I took the ones their families could spare and the ones with hero fire in their eyes, not the young fathers and not those who would break hearts with their leaving. We were better equipped than many founders of dynasties had been when they walked north to dethrone an emperor. They had been peasants like us. Millions of us had laid our hoes down on the dry ground and faced north. We sat in the fields from which the dragon had withdrawn its moisture and sharpened those hoes. Then, though it to be ten thousand miles away, we walked to the palace we would report to the emperor. The emperor, who sat facing south, must have been very frightened. Peasants everywhere walking day and night toward the capital, toward Peiping. But the last emperors of dynasties must not have been facing in the right direction. For they would not, for they would have seen us and not let us get this hungry. We would not have had to shout our grievances. The peasants would crown as emperor a farmer who knew the earth or a beggar who understood hunger. Thank you, mother. Thank you, father, I said before leaving. They had carved their names and address on me, and I would come back. Often I walked beside my horse to travel abreast of my army. When we had to impress other armies, marauders, columns of refugees filing past one another, 
boy gangs following their martial arts teachers, I mounted and rode in front. The soldiers who owned horses and weapons would pose fiercely on my left and right. The small bands joined us, but sometimes armies of equal or larger strength would fight us. Then screaming a mighty scream and swinging two swords over my head, I charged the leaders. I released my bloodthirsty army and my straining war horse. I guided the horse with my knees, freeing both hands for sword work, spinning green and silver circles all around me. I inspired my army, and I fed them. At night, I sang to them glorious songs that came out of the sky and into my head. When I opened my mouth, the songs poured out and were loud enough for the whole encampment to hear. My army stretched out for a mile. We sewed red flags and tied the red scraps around arms, legs, horses' tails. We wore our red clothes so happy that when we visited a village, we would look as happy as for New Year's Day. Then people would want to join the ranks. My army did not rape, only taking food where there was an abundance. We brought order wherever we went. When I won over a goodly number of fighters, I built up an army enough to attack fiefdoms and to pursue the enemies I had seen in the water gourd. My first opponent turned out to be a giant, so much bigger than the toy general I used to peep at. During the charge, I singled out the leader who grew as he ran toward me. Our eyes locked until his height made me strain my neck looking up my throat so vulnerable to the stroke of a knife that my eyes dropped to the secret death points on the huge body. First I cut off his leg with one sword swipe as Chen Lan Feng had chopped the leg off the thunder god. When the giant stumped toward me, I cut off his head. Instantly he reverted to his true self, a snake, and slithered away hissing. The fighting around me stopped as the combatants' eyes and mouths opened wide in amazement. The giant's spells now broken. His soldiers, seeing that they had been led by a snake, pledged their loyalty to me. In the stillness after battle, I looked up at the mountaintops. Perhaps the old man and woman were watching me and would enjoy my knowing it. They laughed to see a creature winking at them from the bottom of the water gourd. But on a green ledge above the battlefield, I saw the giant's wives crying. They had climbed out of their palanquins to watch their husband fight me, and now they were holding each other, weeping. They were two sisters, two tiny fairies against the sky, widows from now on. Their long undersleeves, which they had pulled out to wipe their tears, flew white morning in the mountain wind. After a time, they got back into their sedan chairs, and their servants carried them away. I led my army northward, rarely having to sidetrack. The emperor himself sent the enemies I was hunting, chasing after me. Sometimes they attacked us on two or three sides. Sometimes they ambushed me when I rode ahead. We would always win. Quan Kung, the god of war and literature writing before me. I would be told of in, in fairy tales myself. I overheard some soldiers, and now there were many who had not met me say that whenever we had been in danger of losing, I made a throwing gesture, and the opposing army would fall, hurled across the battlefield. Hailstones as big as heads would shoot out of the sky, and the lightning would stab like swords, but never at those on my side. On his side, they said. I never told them the truth. Chinese executed women who disguised themselves as soldiers or students, no matter how bravely they fought or how high they scored on the examinations. One spring morning, I was at work in my tent repairing equipment patching my clothes and studying maps when a voice said, General, may I visit you in your tent, please? As if it were my own home, 
I did not allow strangers in my tent, and since I had no family with me, no one ever visited inside. Riverbanks, hillsides, the cool sloped rooms under the pine trees. China provides her soldiers with meeting places enough. I opened the tent flap, and there in the sunlight stood my own husband with arms full of wild flowers for me. You are beautiful, he said, and meant it truly. I have looked for you everywhere. I've been looking for you since the day that bird flew away with you. We were so pleased with each other, the childhood friend found at last, the childhood friend mysteriously grown up. I followed you, but you skimmed over the rocks until I lost you. I've looked for you too, I said, the tent now snug around us like a secret house when we were kids. Whenever I heard about a good fighter, I went to see if it were you, I said. I saw you marry me. I'm so glad you married me. He wept when he took off my shirt and saw the scar words on my back. He loosened my hair and covered the words with it. I turned around and touched his face, loving the familiar first. So for a time I had a partner, my husband and I. Soldiers together just as when we were little soldiers playing in the village. We rode side by side into battle. When I became pregnant during the last four months, I wore my armor, altered so that I looked like a powerful big man. As a fat man, I walked with the foot soldiers so as not to jounce the gestation. Now when I was naked, I was a strange human being indeed. Words carved on my back and the baby large in front. I hid from battle only once when I gave birth to our baby. In dark and silver dreams, I had seen him falling from the sky, each night closer to the earth, his soul a star. Just before labor began, the last star rays sank into my belly. My husband would talk to me and not go, though I said for him to return to the battlefield. He caught the baby a boy, and put it on my breast. What are we going to do with this? he asked, holding up the piece of umbilical cord that had been closest to the baby. Let's tie it to a flagpole until it dries, I said. We had both seen the boxes in which our parents kept the dried cords of all their children. This one was yours, and this yours. My mother would say to us brothers and sisters and fill us with awe that she could remember. We made a sling for the baby inside my big armor and rode back into the thickest part of the fighting. The umbilical cord flew with the red flag and made us laugh. At night inside our own tent, I let the baby ride on my back. The sling was made of red satin and purple silk. The four paisley straps that tied across my breasts and around my waist ended in housewife's pockets lined with a coin, a seed, a nut, and a juniper leaf. At the back of the sling I had sewn a tiny quilted triangle, red at its center against two shades of green. It marked the baby's nape for luck. I walked bowed, and the baby warmed himself against me, his breathing in rhythm with mine his heart beating like my heart. When the baby was a month old, we gave him a name and shaved his head. For the full month ceremony, my husband had found two eggs, which we dyed red by boiling them with a flag. I peeled one and rolled it all over the baby's head, his eyes, his lips, off his bump of a nose, his cheeks, his dear bald head and fontanelle. I had brought dried grapefruit peel in my saddlebag and we also boiled that. We washed our heads and hands in the grapefruit water, dabbing it on the baby's forehead and hands. Then I gave my husband the baby and told him to take it to his family, and I gave him all the money we had taken on raids to take to my family. Go now, I said, before he is old enough to recognize me. While the blur is still in his eyes and the little fists shut tight like buds, I'll send my baby away from me. I altered my clothes and began again, the slim young man. Only now, 
I would get so lonely with the tent so empty that I slept outside. My white horse overturned buckets and danced on them. It lifted full wine cups with its teeth. The strong soldiers lifted the horse in a wooden tub while it danced on the stone drums and flute music. I played with the soldiers, throwing arrows into a bronze jar.